Good evening, everybody. I welcome you all to the first Indra Foundation Distinguished Lecture Series. And the lecture will be delivered by Professor Jonathan Mark Enoya, who is not new to India. He was born, I educated in India, he had his basic education in India, then he went to US and worked on archaeology, various facets of archaeology. He worked under famous American Harappan archaeologist George F. Dales. He participated in the excavations at Balak, Balakot in Pakistan, where he was introduced to the various uh, technological aspects. He worked extensively on the shell industries from Balakot, which later formed part of his thesis. Then he went on to excavate uh, Harappa, initially as the co-director, then as the uh, director of the excavations there, and he carried out various experiments on the technological and scientific aspects of Harappan civilization. So after nearly 15 to 20 years of excavations at Harappa, we are now in a better situation to understand various facets of the Harappan technology and ultimately how this technology led to the Harappan economic growth and ultimately they traded with the Mesopotamian civilization also. So uh, first of all I request uh, Professor Jain to introduce us uh, about the Indra Foundation and the lecture series. Now, employees of IIT Gandhinagar or students of IIT Gandhinagar. Anybody from outside? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Okay, good. Uh, so the idea was that uh, we would like to create a series of public lectures uh, by some very distinguished people uh, in areas of uh, broad interest. And uh, we would like the city to look towards IIT Gandhinagar where they could walk in and attend a lecture once in a while. And this is the first lecture of this kind. Some of my colleagues have made an effort to reach out to the public. But obviously, the number of people in the hall uh, is not enough to say that it is still uh, the public lecture that we wanted. I would eventually like that for every uh, one or two person, one person in the institute, uh, there should be at least equally equal to one person from outside the institute. That is when I would say that uh, this has worked uh, well. Anyway, uh, it's a beginning we have made. Uh, we had a uh, conversation with one of our significant donors, Mr. Avinash Manandhare. He's an IIT Bombay graduate, uh, has done very well in profession, lives in uh, New York area, and has been a very strong supporter of whatever IIT Gandhinagar has been doing. And uh, uh, he and his wife have created this foundation in the name of his mother, uh, and that is how Indra Foundation. And then he very uh, generously agreed that uh, this will be named after his mother and this will be a lecture series that we would have uh, <coughs> once a year. Uh, considering that this is the first lecture of its kind, we are extremely delighted to have uh, Mark Canoyer agree to be the first speaker of the series uh, because it is extremely important for a lecture series of this kind to uh, have initially a few speakers who are really uh, world class so that they set the benchmark and uh, hopefully uh, in future people would start to anticipate uh, the quality of the lectures. So uh, from uh, the institute side we are extremely happy, uh, extremely grateful uh, both to Mr. Avinash and his wife for supporting this lecture series and to Mark Kaloya for uh, agreeing to be the first speaker and to all of you for being here today. Thank you very much. I would like to invite Professor Mark Kenoyer to deliver the first lecture. Thank you very much. Um, how many people have cell phones? Raise your hand. How many know where the off button is? <laughs> Please turn them off, okay? Not silent, not vibration, just turn them off. I want your undivided attention. You get that money. Because this is about a technology that sets the foundation for everything that we have, including your cell phones. Okay? So um, we can get a better understanding with this background. First, I would like to thank the Indira Foundation for um, sponsoring this talk, and also for the, the director, uh, Sudhir Jain, for inviting me to have this honor to be able to present to you a discussion of scientific and technological contributions of the Indus civilization. And not only their contribution, but also their relevance to the present. 
So I only have one hour, and I've tried to put many, many things into this talk. Um, so I may go a bit over, and I apologize in advance, but I will try to cover some of the things that I have mentioned in my abstract. Before beginning, I'd also like to thank the Department of Archaeology and Museums, Government of Pakistan, and the Archaeological Survey of India for allowing me to work in both countries on the ancient Indus civilization. Um, many faculty and students from universities in India and Pakistan and around the world have collaborated with me on various forms of research, and I want to thank them for their uh, sharing their knowledge because I'll be presenting some ideas that we have developed through communications. I also have many different sponsors, which I've put up here, uh, that have provided uh, funding for my research. The Indus civilization is one of four other major civilizations in the old world, plus there are two in the new world, which emerged around 3,000, 3,500 BC and began developing eventually urban centers. And in the past, many people said we don't know a lot about them, but I think now, after over 150, in some places, 200 years of research, we do know quite a lot about these civilizations, and we are getting a much better understanding of how they emerged, and also how they interacted. So even though I'm talking about only the Indus civilization today, I want to make sure that everyone understands that the Indus civilization is not isolated. It emerged through autochthonous, meaning local responses to the environment, and local ideas developing, developed by local people, but it could not have emerged if there hadn't been Mesopotamia, Egypt, and China in the landscape. These other urban centers were also developing. They were sending traders and, and interaction across great distances, and it's through the stimulus from the Mediterranean to the East Asian region that we see the development of these urban centers. They developed in alluvial plains where there was enough resources to support urban centers and populations, and all of them emerged along a similar trajectory. Now the Indus civilization covers an area that is twice the size of Mesopotamia and Egypt. Immediately from this map you need to say something else is going on here. It's not the same. So we know that certain new factors were developing. There were two major river systems. There were also huge resource areas that are still being exploited by the countries living in this area. Afghanistan, India, Pakistan, and in the very north, China. Uh, in these other areas, Oman. So these country, modern countries are exploiting the resources that set the foundation for these early urban centers. The Indus was not isolated even within the South Asia. It was surrounded by many other cultures that were developing important technologies and interaction networks and social organizations that themselves stimulated and interacted with the Indus. So we need to understand that whatever was happening in the Indus region, from Gujarat all the way up into um, Swat and Deir in northern Pakistan, they were all connected to areas surrounding this area as well. And I don't have time to go into all the details of these early developments. I'm going to focus on the urban phase in, in this lecture. But the basic foundations can be traced at Harappa, where I've been excavating for the last 30 years, uh, to about 4000 BC. And 3700 is when we can date the site, which dates to the Ravi phase. And Harappa, which is located on the Ravi River, which is a tributary of the Indus, is actually part of a huge network of sites that have been mapped now by archaeologists from um, all over the region. And my colleague Randall Law has been able to put these into a database so that you can go into Google Earth and actually zoom in and see where these sites are. So you can see that there are thousands of sites all over this region which represent the early cultures that were developing at this time period. You can also see that there are huge areas that are blank. This area does not mean that there are no sites there. It means that they have not been studied properly or that there's a desert on top of that area presently. Uh, and so a lot of areas are still need to be studied. So there's a huge scope for students to investigate more aspects of Indus civilization to be able to understand its origins. Maybe we can get the uh, tractor to stop because I can't talk with this noise. Thing. Hello? You told me it would stop at 5 o'clock, so... 
uh, it's kind of distracting. So the Indus civilization developed networks that interacted and connected cities and settlements that were located along the Indus Valley and in what's called the Saraswati Gaga Hakra Nara River. This is another river system that's flowing along this side. And what we see emerging are major urban centers that form a network. So Ratigari is the most current one that's being excavated in, in Haryana. Harappa is the next one. Then we have Ganvediwala, we have Mohenjo-Daro, and then you go down here, you have Dholavira. Uh, Dr. Bisp is here. I want to um, make sure everyone understands. He is the leading scholar in India who's excavated the Dholavira and has been doing some amazing work there. And my, my talk today will be focusing mainly on what I work on in Harappa, but he has equally important things that are coming from Dola Vira that connect with the things that I'm presenting. The urban integration era starts around 2600 BC to about 1900 BC. And this is something that is featured throughout the region of the Indus, uh, including Gujarat. And the people who developed these cities um, were organized in a complex social network that included probably many different um, powerful uh, um, political leaders, uh, landowners, uh, technologists, ritual specialists, and merchants uh, who were clearly <coughs> negotiating with each other to gain power over their settlements. So far we have no evidence for a single ruler, like a king or a ruler for a site. Except Dolavira might be one of the few sites which had a single um, unit controlling because it has a, a sindal area which is very small. Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa, as I'll show, have many different mounds where we have what I think are competing elites. Uh, they used a writing system, which we cannot read. And even if we could read it, we probably wouldn't lear learn very much about their technology and their ideology. These are short inscriptions found on seals and sometimes on pottery that probably identify an individual and um, a clan or a, a, a bureaucrat. And they do not present us with a text which provide information um, about their history and their, uh, their, their ideology. And I'll come, come back to that later. We, all, we know that they used various symbols to identify clans or communities. One of the most important symbols is the unicorn. So in terms of their the first contribution we can say of the Indus civilization is they invented the unicorn. There's no unicorn. We've looked for the bones of unicorns. We found no animals that have one horn coming from the back of their head. So this is an invented animal. Why did they invent this animal? Why didn't they use an animal that they have already seen? We don't know. But we know that they invented it, and they created it as a symbol. And the unicorn symbol spread from the Indus region to Mesopotamia, to Central Asia, to China. You can see unicorns everywhere in the world today. So one place where you don't see unicorns is the Indus Valley. At the end of the Indus civilization, the unicorn symbol disappears. So whatever symbol they created, it's a symbol that no longer had any meaning after their cities were over. But it continued on outside of the Indus Valley. So I, I mean, some of you have come to some of my earlier lectures, and I point out that who could be the community or the individual that rep is represented by the unicorn that is found in every settlement, that is found in all Indus sites, and is also found outside of the Indus Valley? And my answer is middle-level bureaucrats. The people who collect taxes, who make sure you sign the chit properly, who make sure you file the papers properly, they are the people who run governments. They are people who run society. And these people were represented, I think, because we see them in 65% of the seals. And this is what one of the contributions of the Indus cities are, is a developing of a bureaucratic system which was very pervasive. So pervasive that the symbol that they had made for this group was erased from people's memory at the end of it, because people did not want to remember them. OK, so we can say that the unicorn, even though I like the symbol, I think it's a really nice symbol, People of the Indus Valley did not like it, probably, because at the end of the Indus cities, it disappears. It's no longer used. It's like the Nazi use of the swastika. In Europe, you do not see swastika painted on people's houses. In India, we do. We see it everywhere. But here, the swastika means good luck. It means something about it. the goddess, Shubh Lab, right? It has a totally different meaning. 
that in Europe, the use of the swastika was obliterated after World War II. It was forbidden. You couldn't put it. So it's the same thing that I want you to think about. The unicorn is an important symbol of a community that made sure that Indus civilization worked. And it worked for 700 years effectively. They developed important technologies, and they used scientific <coughs> approaches, I think, to the development of those technologies that contributed even till the present day. So even though the unicorn disappears, the technologies and the science that the Indus Valley created continue today. The writing system also disappeared, but we know that the writing system was clearly effective. It was being used to communicate across a huge area. And we don't know which languages were the dominant ones. My own feeling is that many different languages were being represented by this writing system. We know it was written from right to left. And it was effective for communication amongst elites. It was not being used to communicate from elites to common people. Because the Indus seal itself is a a symbol, that, an object that has two levels of communication. One is writing. If you're literate, you can read it. One is an animal symbol, which you don't have to be literate to read. Even today, that system is used throughout the world for elections. So in America, we have a, a donkey and an elephant. If you see the donkey, you know which party it is. If you see the elephant, you know which party it is. In India, for every election, you have symbols as well as names. So the symbol is good for the common people. You don't even have to read to know whose vote you want to put your thumb on, right? So the Rabbit has developed this multiple levels of communication that are effective for communicating to large groups of people. They also developed a numerical system which is uh, quite complex, and we still don't understand it completely. But we have an idea that the base the numbers that were being used are based on 1 to 2 to 4 to 8, and multiples of 4. So this was the common numeral, numeral system that they were using, which are your four fingers on your hand. And people can count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. If you have do Indian music, you know Tintal with 16 beats. So all of these things fit in with a system of numbers that begin with the Indus. They also had a decimal system, which we have clear evidence for in certain types of ob objects. So they combined multiple numerical systems that were used probably in different contexts. Their writing system was combined with trade and also um, international trade. So we have the writing system being used on seals. So this ceiling from Kalibanga shows four seals stamped into one piece of clay. But you notice that the writing is visible for two seals, but only and all four seals, but the unicorns are not visible so much. They didn't, when people are literate, they didn't care about the unicorns. They stamped on top of them. But they wanted to make sure the writing was there. So even though some scholars have argued that the Harappan writing system was not used for writing a language, I don't agree with that. I think it was definitely used for writing a language, and that people were literate. They could read this. We also know that the same symbols for the Harappan script were used <coughs> outside of the Harappan area to write other languages. This is a circular seal from the Persian Gulf, and it's written with Indus writing signs. But if you look at the computer, I mean, use a computer to analyze the relationship of the signs, we can see for sure that this is not the same language as the Harappan script that we see here. This is also a seal from the last phase of the Harappan period, which we call 3C at Harappa. And this has 13 symbols on it. And this sequence also includes some sequences that are not found on some of the earlier seals. So the recent contribution from Harappa is that we can now date the seals from early levels to late levels for over 700 years. The early seals have certain symbols. The middle seals have a different shapes of symbols. And the late seals have a different shapes. There is a continuity, but there is also a change. This suggests that the Harappan writing system itself was changing over time. And writing systems change when new languages come in or new technologies come in. They have to develop new ways of describing things, of com communicating. So it suggests that we have a lot more to learn. Even though we haven't found a bilingual text, we can still understand the function of this language system. The Harappans also were trading with areas outside the Indus. And we have a very clear use of a concept of tokens or passport, which was a piece of clay 
stamped on one side with an elephant seal from the Indus. This is found in Mohenjo-daro. And on the other side with a seal from Central Asia, which is a different style. This seal was made in Mohenjo-daro and fired in Mohenjo-daro and actually stayed in Mohenjo-daro, so it never left. Uh, it may have gone and come back, but it clearly is evidence for two merchants stamping one side of each piece of clay, firing it, and then giving it to somebody. So this is kind of a passport which you can use for getting supplies, staying in the hotels or motels, or getting a passport to go into the city and trading from one place to the next. It shows an international bureaucracy that is being developed from in the cities with linking areas outside. Important, important to this is that the Indus had trade networks that spread to Central Asia and to Afghanistan and Baluchistan and Oman, but there's no evidence of Mesopotamian seals in the Indus Valley. So the Indus people were going to Mesopotamia, but Mesopotamian seals were not coming in. Central Asian seals were coming to this region, but not from Mesopotamia. If you've heard of the story of Hir and Ranja, Everyone know the Hir Ranja story? <laughs> Where is Ranja from? <clears throat> Bukhara. Okay. So he comes, he's a trader from Bukhara, and he comes into the Punjab and he sees Hir. And so this is the traders that are coming from Central Asia to the Punjab have been doing this since the Harappan times. Um, the work that has been done by Randall Law has shown the networks that link the surrounding areas to the Indus region. This is through the study of technological aspects of materials and also the raw, raw material sourcing using various scientific analyses of the materials. And what Randall has found is that many of the raw materials come from outside of the area that was controlled by the Indus. In regions where there is no Indus pottery, there are no Indus sites, there's nothing that shows, no unicorn seals, nothing that shows that Indus merchants were there controlling. It means that the Indus people had movements or interactions with people outside of their control area and that people were coming in and bringing raw materials to this region. He's also done some very important stuff, studies at Dolavira showing the linkages. So Dolavira has lots of linkages in the area of Kutch and Gujarat. Um, Mohenjo-daro has linkages in southern Baluchistan and parts of Rajasthan. Um, Harappa has mainly connections to the north. And then Raki Gari probably will have lots of connections in this area. So each of the cities controlled had main links next to the areas that they were, they, that they were linked to. Um, the cities in the Indus Plain emerged in a, very, in a very distinctive way. They emerged as small um, uh, agro-pastoral settlements of fishers and farmers and hunters. And then these settlements grew bigger and bigger and bigger. Harappa started as a small 10 hectare site, split into two sections, and then these two sections grew into two small cities that were <coughs> walled. And then new neighborhoods would grow out and walls would be put around them as they became established. So they grow organically. And each of these walled areas can be considered to be politically independent or semi-independent within this city. So these are the competing elites that I think are um, dominating urban centers. Indus cities were also located near the rivers because they needed rivers for access of goods coming up and down. They also needed large tanks of water to supply water for their inhabitants. In Mohenjo-daro, they also drilled wells. Um, at Harappa, um, we, the Ravi now flows to this side of the, the site. <laughs> Uh, we don't know exactly where it flowed in antiquity, but I think it's also still flowed on that far side. Um, but we know that Harappans built their land, their cities on areas that are above the floods. So this is the monsoon in 2010. August 2010 was one of the worst flooding areas of the Indus in known history. And if you go to the Google Earth map, I just downloaded this from Google Earth. This is Sakharori Barrage mountains of the Rodi Hills, where the Indus is captured today. In antiquity, the Indus flowed further to the west. And in very long antiquity, it flowed right along the, the escarpment of the Baluchistan Hills. So when this flooding happened, this huge area was flooded. I was in Sakhar Baraj on May 24th in 2010, and I took this photograph 
of this pylon. My friend Hassan Malla took this photograph on August 19th. You can see that that pylon is now almost underwater. And this is the area south of that barrage. To the north, everything was flooded. So how did the Indus people deal with floods? This is one, a 100 year flood. But the Harappans knew how to live there for 700 years. So they built their sites on mounds. Now I took these top photographs from the internet. These are the people who survived the flood. And where are they living? They're living on top of ancient mounds. Everywhere in the Punjab where there's an ancient mound, people would go and live on top of it during the flooding season. The Hindu did not get affected by the 2010 flood. It was above the flood levels. And this is the river at the low water level in the winter time. And we know that the water came up to this high level uh, during that 2010 flood. But they had built some big dams or bund, and the water came just to the top of the bund, which is at the level of this flood, this plain here. So Mahindradaro is still another 13, 15 meters above that. And part of that rise is because they built the settlements on high land between rivers. They found the highest spot, and that's where they built their cities. Because these cities were meant to last. They were meant to last for thousands of years. They didn't have to move them every five years because of flooding. And they also surrounded the cities with city with walls. Now, in many, many early studies, people thought the walls were built to protect from flooding. We have no evidence that these walls protected from flooding. These walls were built to contain the settlement. And people living inside a walled settlement tend to collect garbage, and they build it up higher and higher, and it automatically becomes higher. So these walls were not built to protect for flooding, but they were built to contain the settlements. This is another contribution, because how do you build massive walls using mud brick? Earlier people in Indus built walls in the headgun, but they built them without standardized sizes. When you need to build a city wall, you need to have standardized sites. And Harappans developed a standard size for bricks that is based on, I'll explain it in a minute, a one to two to four ratio. The size of bricks, I've had replicated walls built by my team, by my team in Harappa. And we can say that three people taking three days can make 500 large bricks. They can make 1,000 small bricks. These are 10 by 20 by 40 centimeters or 7 by 14 by 28, 1 to 2 to 4 ratio. If you look in this wall, you'll see that there are different colors of bricks. The clay around Harappa is not enough to build a city wall. They had to bring clay from up to 10 kilometers away to, brick to build a city wall. So the clay is different around Harappa in different parts. So this means you have to have a sardar or somebody in charge that can say every village has to provide 10 million bricks and they all have to be the same size because we want to build a wall around my settlement, right? So this is a type of labor mobilization that is unheard of in earlier times. These bricks are very big. The wet bricks weigh 17 kilos when they're made. And if you've ever played with clay, 17 kilos is a lot to lift. Boom, to make a brick. The small one, when they're dry, they're 14 kilos. So how many of them can you carry on your head? We find groups of four and five bricks of the same color. So that argues that people were carrying bricks on their head and bringing them to the mystery who was building the wall and then dumping them. And that's the colors that we see matching. Smaller bricks are used for houses. So I've calculated how many people would, it would take to build the wall of Harappa during the early phase. That wall was 1,500 meters long, two and a half meters wide, and four, five and four meters high, approximately. It would take 610 people three months to build. It's very hard to get 610 people all working together for three months at the same time. But somebody did, and because they built that wall all in one, one go. The later wall was much longer, and it would take 2,013 people three months to build, because it was wider and taller. So it demonstrates the capacity to mobilize labor and also to standardize production so that all the bricks are the same size. I've measured hundreds of thousands of these bricks. They are all the same ratio, one to two to four. 
Even today, it's very difficult to, to get that kind of standardization. So that led many people to think that there was a very strict regulation of brick sizes by a, a dominating government. The question is, was there such a government? We don't have kings, we don't have palaces, we don't have any indication of it, so how can you regulate this? And my argument is that this regulation is cultural. This is a, a concept of, of proportion that is widespread throughout the Indus Valley. It's spread in the Indus core area and into Gujarat. Even in Dolavira, most of the bricks are one to two to four. The exact sizes are not the same as Harappa, but they're slightly off, but they're about the same. And even at Harappa, the early bricks tend to be a bit bigger and the later bricks a bit smaller, so brick sizes, absolute sizes, changed over time, but the proportions didn't. And the Harappans developed a technology which is called header and stretcher. If you lay a brick this way and you lay a brick this way, it helps bond it together. Here in India, it was called English bond, right? I call it Harappan bond, because the Harappans were here before the English. Okay? So, it's called Saru Bai in Punjabi. Saru is the head and Bai is the lung. Okay, so Saru Bai, Saru Bai, Katina, you build a wall. Here you can see the Saru, and here you can see the Bai. So this makes a very stable wall, and that, that you can alternate from the inside to the outside to have very strong bonds. Now, many of the earlier scholars, which was during a colonial period, were arguing that there had to be a strong measurement system in, the, in this valley. So they were looking for the rulers that were used to measure the bricks. If you go to any brick factory today, you'll see no rulers. <laughs> so in Mohenjo-daro, they found one piece of shell in a very huge site, one piece of shell that had some lines and a design on it. And because they could measure these lines, and they saw another circle here, they said this is the ruler, Harappan ruler. And they made some divisions and they calculated and they said this is the Harappan, the style of ruler from Mohenjo-daro. Madhu said Vats was excavating in Harappa. So he said if, if Marshall can find a ruler at Mohenjo-daro, I can find a ruler at Harappa. So he looked all over, they didn't find any shell pieces, but they found a piece of bronze that had four marks on it. So these marks, three marks, sorry, four divisions. So he measured them and he came up with a slightly different measurement. So he said, this is a Harappa ruler. So one ruler for Harappa, one ruler for Manjadaro over 700 years. That's not a good measurement system. Um, S.R. Rao was excavating Lotal and he found a piece of ivory, which also has some marks. They're not evenly spaced. And he came up with a different calculation, which he associated with the Arthashastra. And he argued that this is the Angula. Um, all three of these things are, in my opinion, not valid arguments. So neither Mohenjo-daro ruler, Harappa ruler, or Lokpa ruler are, in my opinion, rulers. Harappans, I think, were measuring with body proportion. They were using fingers, they were using their hands, they were using their elbows, <coughs> using body, and this is how they measured and they used a proportional system, which is still the system that most people use today throughout South Asia and actually throughout the world. So it's a very common system in very in many areas. Um, what they did with that is that they were able to create architectural structures that were very stable. And I'm not going to go into all the architecture of the Indus cities, but I want to explain some of one of the most important developments that they did, which was the architecture for providing um, spaces and isolated spaces within, within a house that associate with cleanliness and um, defilement. So if you have to get water you, for your house, you can walk outside and get it from the tank, or you can drill a well in your house and have fresh water. So Mohenjo-daro was a big settlement. It may have had between 40 to 80,000 people, and it had wells in every neighborhood. Every neighborhood would have its own well. Every house also had its own bathing platform. Bathing platforms associated with wells pr provide a place for people to wash themselves and keep themselves clean. They also had latrines, which the earlier excavators did not identify. They did not think these were latrines. They called them post-cremation burial urns because sometimes they had some ash in them, sometimes they had some bone in them, 
and they made up this story that these were burial urns. So in Mohenjo-daro and in Harappa, they called them post-cremation burial urns. Actually, they're latrines. They're a commode. And they were filled with garbage because that's where you throw garbage. You throw it in your latrine. And you can use it and clean it out, or you can use it and then fill it up and pull another one on top of it. They used water pots for cleaning themselves, and they used this system, which provides hygiene and sanitation within a city which is highly densely populated. So Harappans developed a way for clean water and sewage water to be separated, and they developed it in a way that would allow many people from different communities to live near each other without having conflict. So this is the most important contribution for their urban planning was not so much the sanitation, because you know that latrines stink very bad in the summertime. Um, and this is right next to the doors of the houses. But at least it keeps your filth from going into somebody else's house. And this keeps people from fighting each other within a city. People who didn't have wells were also given um, a location where they could um, get water. And we have areas for water to be uh, provided to people who are not associated with the neighborhood, so public wells. We also see a location of kitchens, at Harappa for, at least, which are primarily in the northeast corner. They're also this way in Naosharo and in several other sites where people have done a very good uh, documentation of them. Um, so the kitchens are found in the northeast corner of the house, which, if you think about it, is where the sun comes up first. You have to make food. You're located in an area that gets the first morning light, and this is the place where people in the family will come and cook. So the northeast corner of the house is the best place to have the kitchen. It gets warm sun. It get, you can cook there early in the morning. And this pattern continues throughout the Harappan period. So when we come to later time periods where we have literary evidence for proper location of auspicious places, the kitchen is also the place where you probably do your first rituals, cleaning the food, worshiping the deities, to prepare the food for the family. And in the Vastu Purana, the location of the northeast is considered to be the most sacred. Because the Vastu is paced down, and the northeast portion is the place which is sacred. The southwest is the most polluted. Most Harappan cemeteries are located in the south and west of the settlement. Many of the productions of the kilns and <coughs> firings are on the southern parts and the western parts of sites because they are filthy and smoky and the smoke blows to the west. Because in the Punjab, in northern Pakistan, the wind primarily blows from the northeast. So this brings fresh air to that side and blows <coughs> the, the smoke to the other side. This is something that needs to be investigated, because I know in some parts the orientation would be different, and different people have different de de depictions of what is the proper uh, Vastu Purana location. We also know that they were developing ways to have strong isolation within cities to pr pr provide privacy but also fresh air. So the concept of jalis on your windows and kirkis so that you can open and close them to provide light is something that was first developed in Harappan houses. And this is a very clear development that we see in second story and multiple story houses in the Harappan toy houses that were built for, for by children or maybe for ritual, similar to what you see today. And all of this was to provide a facility for the people who lived in Harappan cities to interact and also to develop their own uh, status and their, their wealth. And we know that some of the people in the Harappan cities were very wealthy. So we have some very powerful and wealthy people who depicted themselves with lots of ornaments. Sometimes they would bury these ornaments in the ground. And we see bronze, silver, gold, beads, all provided as a way of ornamentation uh, for some of the uh, Harappan people. Some of these people also went to Mesopotamia. We have clear indication that they were trading and going to far distant regions. The types of ornaments that they wore include many things that we still use in South Asia today. And bangles, I think, is one of the most important diagnostic features of Harappan ornamentation that is much more distinct than what we see in Egypt and Mesopotamia and in China. When I was excavating at Harappa, we would find thousands of bangles. And I called my friends who were working in Egypt 
And I said, how many mangoes did you find in your excavation this year? Mm, five, six, seven. I have hundreds of thousands of mangoes. I call my friends who work in Mesopotamia. How many mangoes did you find? Uh, 10, 20, maybe. And those are probably from Indus people. <laughs> the Harappans use bangles as a form of nonverbal communication. You wear your bangles, you can see who the person is, what their class is, what their wealth is, what their community is. So I won't go into all the details, but they also wore, I mean, these bangles were combined with textiles. And the textile development of the Indus is something that really sets, I think, the important tone for their technological development. Textiles can be spun at home, and you can make them, but you can also develop industrial quality textiles. And the Harappans were the first to develop the spinning wheel, in my opinion. And we see a change in spindle whorls. The spindle whorls from hand spinning from the earlier period disappears, and we start seeing copper spindles being found, which were probably used to make very, very fine threads. So Harappans were developing an industrial quality of spinning, which creates a textile, and they also were the ones who probably developed cotton production on a high, high huge scale, and cotton was traded to Mesopotamia and areas to the west. We also have, from Harappa, the first evidence for the use of silk. Now, most people don't think of Harappans and silk, but we know that Harappa had some tassar silk, which was found inside of a necklace, and this is the earliest evidence for silk in South Asia. So tassar is a wild silk, and it grows even to, it lives in a, a, a moth that flies around even today, and it grows, it lives in every part of South Asia. So depending on the tree it lives on, the quality of the silk is different. <coughs> and we also have evidence for the weaving of this silk, to weave it. So not only were they using it as tassels and threads, but they were also weaving textiles. This means that they were producing very fine textiles, both in cotton and silk, which were probably used for trade within the region and also outside the area. Textiles without color are not very useful. I mean, you can have a white textile or a blue textile, but to make um, different types of dyes is also a scientific development. So Harappans, I think, were the first to develop indigo as an important dyeing technology. And these circular platforms from Harappa, I argue, are the earliest evidence for possible indigo production on a large scale, which would have the use of blue dye to create textiles that would have been traded throughout the Indus as well as surrounding regions. We know from the so-called priest king sculpture from Mohenjo-daro, the original excavators, when they found it, found inside this area red color, and in the outside area a greenish color, which could have been blue or green, which would indicate that they were using a red, white, and green, and blue composition for this textile, which is the same colors that are used traditionally. Al is a root that makes red color, and ni is your leaf that makes blue, and then you can bleach it with different kinds of bleaches to make a white textile. So this would be the main the textile design. We also see that they were wearing different ornaments made of stone, uh, fired steatite, and banded stones. This stone itself is important from Harappa because we know that it was probably made in a workshop in one part of Harappa where we found a rough piece but work on, in Dolavira that we were studying the beads with Prabhakar and Randall Law, they found an unfinished piece of the same stone from Dolavira. So this means that this stone came from Dolavira to Harappa, to this workshop, was made into a bead, and then worn on the neck of this individual. So this shows a long distance trade networks between different parts of the Indus, providing raw materials and also a sharing of the technology. And the technology for drilling beads is also a new development that the Harappans uh, invented. They invented, they, they found a special rock, which they could have only found by doing systematic surveys of the geology of the region. We don't know where they found this rock. It could have been found in Kutch, it could have been found in Baluchistan, we're still trying to identify the exact source. When the last Indus bead makers died, they, we lost the, the knowledge of this source. So this stone is harder than chert. It's harder than most other rocks, and very, very strong, 
and resilient. So it's, it's able to dr drill very long beads such as this or hard rustler granite. Uh, garment. Um, this is a technology of chipping and grinding that they developed. They developed a spe specialized type of constricted cylindrical drill, which has a wider tip than the back. All modern drilling is based on this principle. And this principle was not being used in Egypt or Mesopotamia or the Mediterranean or any other regions that we have evidence for. So solid drills with a wider tip than the back was not being done up in other places. And I, I argue that the structure of Harappan Ernestite drills set the foundation for the diamond drilling technology that becomes important in later South Asia. Um, I'm going to go through this a little bit quickly because we have other technologies of alkali, how to color stone with permanent designs. These are beads from Dolavira. How to cut shell with specialized metal tools made of bronze. The shell bangles of the Indus are very distinctive. Um, they were the first people to develop shell ornaments of this style. And they did it by chipping, sawing, grinding, cutting, and incising the shells in a technique that is very similar to what is used traditionally in South Asia. So this saw, which is still used traditionally in Bengal, is called a korak, has a highly tempered steel edge that is 0.7 millimeters thick. Harappan bronze saws were 0.7 millimeters thick and cut as effectively as modern steel saws. So this means Harappans developed a arsenical bronze, probably, that was as effective as steel for cutting. So there's no reason for them to develop iron technology, because they had bronze technology that was very effective. And it wasn't until a later time period when they lost the ability to get arsenical ores and tin that iron became a necessity. And iron develops out of a, a, a situation where certain alloys could not be created. Uh, Harappan ceramics, I don't have time to go into great detail, but I want to just kind of give you some images. Um, developed using a, a, a wheel that was not, um, that was a stable wheel. So they, they used a kick wheel for making most of their pottery and the, and the main in this region which allowed them to big, build big vessels that are very large. Um, these are some examples of the main Harappan forms. And we've done replications of it using the same kind of kick wheel um, at uh, Harappa with some of the local potters. Um, the vessels require a stable wheel that cannot be done with a stick turned wheel. So the, the stable wheel was something that was being developed and used effectively in, in this valley. They also developed firing techniques to fire ceramics at over 1,000 degrees Celsius and maintain that temperature in a reducing atmosphere, which is extremely difficult to do. And I've been trying to replicate this technology for the last 30 years. I have not been successful. So Harappans were making a stoneware that was never made until the 1700s in England. So before that time period, nobody except the Harappans had made this kind of stoneware of silicon. This is one of the canisters that they were using to make it. They also made a glazed ceramic, which is called fan. This was fired to around 960 degrees Celsius in a reducing atmosphere as well. And they were able to create different glazes by melting silica and keeping a core of, of uh, crushed quartz to hold the shape together. This set the foundation for glass production which eventually glass bangles we see today in South Asia are an important component. They also developed techniques for coloring. This is iron and probably bone, and this is copper, different colorants using different uh, com compositions. And they were able to glaze them at the same temperature. So glazing with iron and glazing with bone means that you have to know the exact composition of how much iron to put in there and how much bone to put in there to make both of them melt and become glass at the same time. So this is a very delicate um, percentage that they had to, do, to understand. Uh, and all of this was done with basically hand grinding of the materials and processing and weighing with very simple technology. Now I'm going to end my discussion with copper and metals, that, which is something that I've been doing here in IIT Gandhi Nagar with Alok uh, and uh, Prabhakar. Um, on uh, trying to understand these technologies. 
Toropin copper metallurgy is highly varied. They used many different alloys. They made more types of objects of bronze and copper than any of the other early civilizations. So other societies tended to have one or two varieties of copper, but the Harappans had high tin bronze, or relatively high tin bronze, tin bronze, and they had arsenic <coughs> bronze, and they had lead arsenic and tin combinations, so they had many different varieties that they were doing. And part of that is because they were able to master the resources that were surrounding this region. So arsenical bronzes are primarily found in this part of the Bojistan. We have some possible arsenical bronzes in northern Rajasthan, but this area tends to have more um, lead mixed with the copper, and in some places, uh, zinc. Harappans tended not to use zinc. We have it in a few sites, but most of the time they didn't use it. They also got copper from Oman, and they possibly got materials from the Himalayas. So all of these different areas providing resources for the Harappan region um, led to some important ramifications. So, so far I've been talking about all the good things the Harappans did, but they also destroyed their environment. So this is a lesson that we can learn today. This is the place called dasht i Margo, which means the, the desert of death, because there's nothing living there today. This is the main copper source in Baluchistan, where the Harappan the people who were linking to the Harappans and possibly Harappans were cutting every tree down to make charcoal to smelt copper and good tin for their cities. They also sent this to Mesopotamia and to other parts of Iran. Today, this place is desolate. And when you do excessive mining without regenerating your environment, it's still desert. And it will never come back until people intentionally go in there and try to repair it. Um, so I just want to remind people that it's not always rosy. There are things that the people did in the past that have still impact our present day. And we need to keep that in mind when we start doing mining, etc. Um, as a part of our project, we went to Ambaji to collect ore. Um, here is some of the ore sources, uh, Alok and Prabhakar for processing the ore. This is examples of the types of ore that we collected. Uh, which include chalcosite, chrysocolla, bronconite, tacomite, malachite, azurite. These have all been analyzed from samples that I took last year working with MS University. Then we had a smelting, which was taking place right outside. Some of you came by and visited. Um, and we hopefully will do one more before we go, before I go. But this is the beginning of the traditional copper smelting using the techniques that the Harappans might have had. And we had very good results. So we have some good copper, um, relatively pure, though there's some places of lead and some uh, zinc associated with it. And Harappan copper technology is what I think was very important because the Harappans were so good at copper working that when the technology for alloying, it was no longer possible to get the alloys. If you can't get tin, you cannot make a hard metal. If you cannot get arsenic, you cannot make a hard metal. But if you know that when you're smelting copper, there are these little other things that you throw away, which is called iron, you know that there's another metal there. And you cannot combine iron with copper. It doesn't work. But I think the ancient Harappans and the late Harappan communities began experimenting because they were not able to get tin, they were not able to get arsenic, because of breakdown in trade networks, and that they were the first people to develop crucible iron and steel. So that's why to the, here we did an experiment with crucible production. And we brought some iron with a high carbon and low carbon, and working with a, one of the um, blacksmiths from Udaipur, as well as one of the local ones from Palaj, we did a smelt or a melting of iron to try to create crucible steel. A crucible steel is called woods, based on a word udu from, from Tamil Nadu. And the South Indian wood steel was one of the most famous steels in the world. So here in, in Gandhinagar, we did a experimental melting of this. Uh, I did this first with one of my students back in the USA. Our first melting was not successful, but our second melting, we did four crucibles. This one over here tilted and actually opened up and we were able to melt the iron to make an ingot. 
And this is a, a micro photograph of the surface where you can see cementite pearlite structure and some crystal formation on the outside. And this is um, 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 Virendra Kumar Lohar, whose father is named Gopila Lohar from Udaipur. And he helped us cut this, the one that did not succeed in melting. You can see the unmelted iron and the melted cast iron and the pieces not stuck melted together with some glassy matrix above. And the second melting was, I would say, partly successful because all of the pieces did not melt. There's still some pieces there that didn't melt. But what we did find is if you can see this photograph, I don't know if you can see it from there, but you can see the microstructure of the laminates of high carbon steel and low carbon iron, which creates the crucible steel that we uh, is so famous. This area here is carbon, and the ancient ores had also vanadium and antimony and other minerals in them, which allowed the production of a very um, distinctive form of steel. So my feeling is that Harappan craftsmen with their high technology of metallurgy were probably the ones who started experimenting with iron and eventually led to the production of uh, iron, use of iron to make tools and then eventually steel. Um, how did the in this master artisans transfer knowledge? Uh, my argument is that they did this through apprenticeship and oral traditions, and that we have evidence for that in the narrative scenes that appear on Indus seals. And Dr. Bisht excavated the site of Banavali, and he found one of the important ceilings showing a figure with some animals facing them and some writing. Uh, I interpret this as somebody who is clearly controlling these beasts or in somehow in a dominant position. Um, this is a story. We don't know what the story is, but it's through oral traditions and narratives that Harappans were able to codify their scientific knowledge and pass it down from one generation to the next. And it's not something that the Harappans developed themselves. This had been there already from the beginning of time in the period of Nehagar. So in Nehagar we see stories, narratives, of a bull fighting some people. And then here in Mohenjo-daro, the same scene and in Banavali, again, we have the same similar scene. So these scenes were things that had been represented for a long period of time within the, in, the, in this region. Other scenes which we see are similar to ones that we also find in Mesopotamia, so the Harappan motifs of, of killing a water buffalo in front of a deity is copied by Mesopotamian um, um, seal makers where they uh, depict a, a Mesopotamian deity conquering a, 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 um, a water buffalo. These types of scenes represent narratives. It means that the Harappans were developing ways to tell stories and codify knowledge that could be passed down from one generation to the next. We also have uh, deities controlling animals, but one thing that we don't ever see is Harappans killing Harappans. There's no depictions of people killing people or violence between human communities during the Harappan period. So this is something that's very important to keep in mind. Um, we also see combinations of human and animal forms, which sometimes you said this I already is a female figure, of a female head with a feline body, and here is a male head with a feline body. So tiger, animal, or tiger and human combinations uh, representing powerful beings in, this, in the animal world were combined with humans. And some of these probably were beneficial, and some of them may have been um, scary. Uh, the one that I like the most, and I like to end my talk with, is the form which has a tiger face, bull's horn, and human face combined. So this form is found in Harappan times, sometimes with the beard spread out, and sometimes with the beard flat suggesting that this form has a peaceful and an enraged component. Um, I argue that this is the same type of beard that you see on many of the Rajas in Rajasthan, which is combed out. So this is the Sher part of the Sher Sin. So Sin means lion and Sher means tiger. So Sher is this beard, short beard that comes out. And in later traditions, this is associated with the Kiptimukha. So Kirti Mukha, I don't need to explain to people, but it's a protective symbol found on temples. 
We see it on the Menakshi Devi Temple. We see it in tribal amulets. We also see it on the mosque in al Mansura, which is a site in southern Pakistan. It's something that's pervasive in South Asian culture, and it became used as a protective symbol. So I'd like to end with the concept that the Harappans are still protecting. The Harappan motifs are still there, and they are still protecting us today. And we can continue to understand their technology and use it to help us understand our own society better. Thank you.